Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vineyardchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Now here's this week's message. It's a story that would go on to change the world, but it happened so long ago that we forget. You know, the same way you can forget what you got last Christmas. And yet here we are, the same thing year after year. We decorate, we rush, we shop, we wrap, we open, we invite, we attend, we eat, we celebrate, we box it all up, wait 12 months, and we do it again. But there's more to the story, more than a tree, more than gifts, and more than just another holiday. And we all want there to be more to this season. The thing is, God knew that. In fact, that was his plan all along. He wants us to have more, more joy, more peace, more of Him. He gave us the perfect gift, and it wasn't wrapped neatly under a tree. The gift He gave wasn't a virgin mother or wise men. It wasn't angels, a star, or a manger. The gift He gave was and is the person of Jesus, fully God but completely human. The gift was that He clothed Himself in humanity and embarked on a rescue mission one that would give hope to all mankind. And the story that would change the world forever began like this. Well, good morning. How are we doing this morning? We're doing good? Are we alive or awake? My name is, is Pastor Parker. I'm the, the assistant pastor in the student ministries here, so youth and young adults. Um, but hey, guys, it's official. You can listen to Christmas music without being judged. I know I was doing it all day yesterday, and I'm really excited. Uh, Thanksgiving and Black Friday are over, you know, but just in case you haven't spent your savings account yet, <laughs> Cyber Monday is tomorrow, so <laughs> don't, don't forget. But it's been a crazy year leading up to this point, right? So much has happened in 2016. We had the 2016 Olympics in Rio, and that was no short of its scandals, but go USA. Um, we had the election process, which is finally over until the Electoral College casts its votes. And then, of course, around the world, crazy events have been happening from bombings to, to terrorist attacks. So much happens. And then we get to this point, the end of the year, you know, a time where it's supposed to be joyful and excited and happy. And you're like, wait, it's already Christmas? What happened? I know for me, this time sneaks up on me so quickly, especially on my bank account. <laughs> I need to plan a little bit better. It also seems like just yesterday, you know, when we were praying for the snow to stop falling, and now it's about to start again. Winter is coming, y'all. Winter is coming. Um, some of y'all got it. It's okay. See, we should be ec excited for this time of year. We should be happy, you know? And, and I have the honor of speaking the first message of our Christmas series, and this series is all about gifts. It's all about gifts. Gifts are great. My grandma was talking to my mom the other day, and she was like, well, what gift should I get Parker this year? And mom was like, just get him, you know, some cash, maybe a Visa gift card. That way he can just get whatever he wants, make it easy. And she says, no, I don't want to do that. And mom goes, why, why not? That's just simple. She says, because if I do that, I know Parker's just going to spend that money on food and bills. I said, you're right. <laughs> she said, I want to get him a gift that he'll actually treat himself with. That's what gifts are for, right? They're meant to celebrate an occasion. They're meant to positively influence our lives. And, and this message, the first message of this series is all about the gift of purpose. The gift of purpose, how God gives purpose to our lives. And we get this idea of giving directly from God. The Bible says that he first breathed life into us in the very beginning. And then, of course, going back to the first Christmas when Jesus was born, the wise men came and they brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I had a friend once, they asked me, they said, why do you have to be wise men? Why couldn't have been wise women? I said, well, that's just what happened. So they just reported on what happened. And they said, would you want to know what would have happened if it was women? I said, please, let me know. I feel like you're going to tell me anyway, tell me. And she said, she said if it was women, they would have asked for directions on the way and got there early, helped deliver the baby, cleaned up afterwards, and that brought practical gifts instead of gold. What's the baby going to do with some gold? That baby needs some diapers. I said, 
says, you're right. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you there. But God says, I'm going to give you the gift of purpose. And it's crazy, right? As if sending his son to die for our sins, be resurrected so that he could defeat death, so that we could have life and life everlasting wasn't enough. As if that wasn't enough, he said, I'm also going to bring purpose to your lives. I'm going to bring meaning to your lives. I'm going to bring assignment unlike any other. That's what I want to do for you. But what is this purpose? See, the scripture talks about many different purposes that God has for us, but I'm going to talk about the one main one that Jesus gives us. And we see this in Matthew 28. It says, Jesus went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice for all I have commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this day after day, right up to the end of the age. Basically, Jesus is saying here, here's what I want you to do. Here's your purpose. I want you to help me rescue this world one person at a time. I want my people to be the one to bring this news of truth and, and of excitement that the kingdom of God is here, that a relationship with God is possible, that heaven is accessible right now. And I want everyone to be a part of that. Now, Jesus describes this a little bit in his Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5, it says, let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your youthfulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. Now, this verse gets me especially excited, and not just because it's really encouraging, but because I love salt. <laughs> not what you were expecting, was it? I love salt salt on my foods. If you ever had food without salt, it's just not the same. I also go to the movies fairly often, and every time I go to the movies, I have to get a number one combo, large soda and a large popcorn. It's just not the same without it. And I'm also that guy at the, like, the condiment section who looks like he's like Dr. Frankenstein trying to resurrect the mo monster of his popcorn. Um, so I want you to take some notes on this. Whip out your notes app, whip out a piece of paper and some pen. I'm going to give you Parker's tricks to a successful movie experience. First one, when you order your popcorn, you're gonna ask for a box, okay? So you got your bag, you're gonna ask for an additional box, and then you're gonna put half of the popcorn in the box, all right? So we split it in half. Then you're gonna go to the fountain of glory that is the butter, okay? <laughs> you're gonna push that button, and you're gonna move the, the bag around, and then you're gonna add the salt on top, butter first, salt second, and then shake it up, and then you're gonna do the same with the box. And so when you're eating your popcorn in the movie theater, you don't get to the bottom half where it's no longer buttery or salty and it's just bland and you just give it to somebody else because you don't want it anymore. You pay for that popcorn. That's the trick. But what does salt do to our lives on a practical level? It adds flavor, right? It enhances flavor. It also makes us thirsty. The more sodium you consume, the more water you also need to consume. So maybe... Just maybe Jesus is calling us to live our lives in a way that enhances life, that adds flavor to life, that, that adds an individuality to life, that makes people so attracted to the truth of God just by the way that we live, to make people thirst for that truth of God. And in the same way, he calls us to be light. Now I'm incredibly thankful for those little lights on the floors at the movie theater. <laughs> Another trick is you dump all of your popcorn into the box before the previews end, and then you send someone to go get a refill. <laughs> that way you have all of your popcorn during the movie, okay? Write that down. Um, and so on the way back, if I'm that person, if I'm elected that person, if there were no lights, I guarantee you I would trip. That's a lot of stuff to carry for one person. I'd be falling on my face. I couldn't find my seat. That's what those lights do, right? They guide us to our spots. They're there for safety. God calls us. To, 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 to light the way to freedom, to light the way to his truth in the same aspect. You know, when I was growing up, uh, I used to go fishing with my grandpa a lot. 
We would fish all the time. He lives out in Ocean View, so we would fish in Chesapeake Bay, along the Bridge Tunnel, and, and even in the ocean. And when we were done fishing, we'd bring them all back to his house, and we'd sit in the backyard, and I would scale the fish with him, and then we would put them in these jars of salt. And I didn't understand it at the time, but salt's also used to preserve things, right? God wants us to preserve the freedoms that he gives us, the values that he gives us, the, the life that he gives us. We have to protect that purpose and the purpose for other people too. I have a tweetable thought for you guys. You can tweet it, post it on Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, text it to somebody you know. But that tweetable thought is, God has a purpose for my life. Very simple. God has a purpose for my life at Vineyard VA. See, sometimes it's hard to grasp that God wants more for our lives than just to come to church on Sunday. Now, don't get me wrong, there's power when we gather together. There's power in a body of Christ coming together with common beliefs to grow and strengthen each other and ask questions and be challenged. But he doesn't call the church to be limited by four walls. He calls it to impact its community, to go out. See, I feel like it's easy to hear these type of messages the, and just to tune them out, you know, because the first thing that we think of are the big trailblazers. We think of T.D. Jakes. We think of Joyce Meyer. You know, we think of Pat Robertson. We think of John Wimber, the founder of the Vineyard Movement. But changing lives doesn't start in those big ways. It doesn't start with a television show. It doesn't start with building a university. It doesn't start with writing a book or traveling the world. Those are amazing things to do. But it starts with our daily life choices. It starts in the routines of our lives. The best and easiest way to impact someone's life is just to live it in a godly way. It's just to live up to the standards that, calls, that God calls us to. It starts by living out our faith, just being an example to others. I want to share a story with you from the Bible. And it's a story I've been studying the past couple weeks. And it's fairly short, but I think it's so influential and so powerful. So let's jump into this. It, it follows Peter and John, two disciples of Jesus. And this is after Jesus died, resurrected, and went to heaven. So they're doing ministry without the physical presence of Jesus, much like us today. So in Acts chapter 3, it says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked at him straight, and, and as did John, and Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went in with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the man who was sitting and begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. See, at first glance, this is just another miracle that happens in the Bible. But when you look into it, the, there's so much more than meets the eye. See, here we have a man who couldn't walk from birth, a grown man who was crippled from the day that he was born. So every single day, someone would pick him up and carry him to the temple of beautiful. That's how he lived. That's how he supported himself. He begged for his money. If he didn't get that, he didn't eat. He wasn't clothed. See, I find it very interesting that of all the places this man to, chose to go to beg, he chose the church. He chose the church to come to and, and to, to, to ask for money. Of all the places he could have gone, of all the temples, he goes to the temple of beautiful. See, the temple of beautiful was called that because it was uh, known to have outshined any other gate there was. A Jewish historian said that it most likely would have been about 75 feet tall, made of fine Corinthian brass, the double doors in the front, so large. Quote, unquote, he said it outshined any other gate made out of silver or gold. It was that beautiful. And it's kind of ironic that this man would go to the temple of beautiful because his condition, his begging, actually would have limited him from entering the gates. He could only go to the doors. He couldn't go inside because he was begging, because of his condition. But every day he chose to go there. Point number one, live life consistently. Live life consistently. See, I think there's a reason 
this man came to this temple every day. There's a reason he decided to go forth. And that's because he knew that if God was as good as God said he was, if the people of God truly followed God in the way that they said they would, something great must happen in the presence of God. Something great must happen where the people of God go, I need to find out what this truth is. Maybe I'll be provided for at the temple of God. See, the same thing happens in our lives when we experience setbacks in our finances or maybe our bosses or, or coworkers or clients ask us to do something that we're not comfortable with or our kids are driving us crazy. God wants us to stay consistent in our faith, to keep moving forward, to be consistent in our pursuit of who God is. See, we'll stand by our godly convictions, we'll live in a way that honors God, and we'll let our mere existence be a testimony to the truth of cross. See, if you believe that God's purpose for you is higher, is greater, is larger than any other thing, why would we compromise in our life? Why would we choose something that's not God's best? See, the truth is, is the moment that we go public with our faith or, or our church affiliation, people are watching you. People now associate God with you or they associate church with you, with us. I had this friend once before I was a Christian, and it was over seven years ago before I was coming to this church, and he went to a Bible study every single morning or, or Wednesday morning, really early in the morning, and then every other Thursday he went to a group meeting, and he was so vocal about this. In my head, I was like, that's kind of cool. But then on the weekends, he was my friend, so I knew that he was also going out to parties. He was jumping from relationships to relationships, and I was confused because he put on this perfect persona. Like, his life was so great, but I knew he was living a different life on the side. And so for me, that, that confused me. My non-Christian mind thought, well, that doesn't make sense to me. Why would I want to go be a part of something that doesn't seem so consistent? But all it took was for one person, one person pursuing God, acknowledging their mistakes, acknowledging their failures, but, but, but trying to choose God's best to invite me to church and get me to come and change my life forever. That's all it takes is just one person. See, the same thing can happen in our workplaces. The same thing can happen in our schools. The thing, same things can happen just on the street. When we live a life of God, people notice that. People are attracted to what you have. See, all it took was for Peter to stay consistent in his faith. Peter could have walked right on by, but he stayed consistent, and this man's life was changed. See, I love that the Bible says Peter and John were on their way to a prayer meeting. <laughs> See, how often is it in life that we get caught up in our routine, that we miss or ignore what God wants to do outside of our routine? I mean, this man came to the temple every single day. That means that people knew who he was. They probably knew his name. Peter and John have probably passed him before. Most people ignore him, right? Point number two, live life compassionately. Live life compassionately. You guys ever go to the mall, and you know those booths in the hallways? It's like 20 million different types of new products every single week, and you got like the wristbands that are supposed to help you balance, and the remote control hel helicopters, and the pillows, and the shirts, and they always try to stop you and get your money. So what do you do? You walk straight. You don't pay attention to them. You don't look them in the eyes. You look straight like you got a place to go, and you walk with a purpose. You're moving. You're like, I got places to go, people to see. Don't talk to me, hoping, women, I see you clinching onto your purses so your wallets don't fly out and spend some money. I see it. That's what these people would have been doing to this man, just walking straight, ignoring him, not, not looking at what's going on. Can anyone relate to those moments where we're just trying to get in, get out, do our business, get home real quick so we can rest, relax, and watch the new season of Gilmore Girls on Netflix? Just kidding, I didn't do that. Maybe I did. But maybe, maybe, just maybe, when you're out and about, all that person at the cash register needs is one person to look at them in the eyes, thank them for their work, and, and say, have a great day, and smile and walk away. You don't know if that, that worker is just trying to pay off their student loans, or, or maybe your grumpy coworker is, is having a rough day because something at home is going on that you're not aware of, and all they need is one person one person to look at them and change their outlook on life, change their outlook on that day. They built a cookout near my house. It was probably the best and worst thing for me, <laughs> literally right across the street. And I was there the other day on Tuesday with some friends, and there was this cash register, and he had this really cool sweater on. It had Snoopy 
from Charlie Brown laying on the doghouse with some Christmas lights. I just thought it was really cool. And so I could have just gone to the, to the front, ordered my cookout tray with my, my chicken tenders, and my corn dog, and my fries with some extra salt and a huge sweet tea, and just left, you know. Or I could have looked at him, which I did. I said, hey, man, that sweater is really cool. I love it. Man, he instantly started smiling. He said, thank you so much. And then I walked away. Sometimes it's that simple to be encouraging, to be a light to the world. It doesn't have to be this thing where you stand on a box and start preaching the gospel, but you can just live your life in a positive way. See, the church should be known for its compassion. The people of God should be known to the world as understanding and caring. We should be known that we want to bring positivity and a light to this world. I have this uncle, and, and I used to go to their house every single Christmas. The entire family would go. We'd eat a bunch of food. We, we'd open presents. And of course, we'd take the annual family photo. He loved photography. And he also had one of those books in his brains of corny jokes, just ready to whip out whenever <laughs> you needed it. And I loved going to their house because they just spoiled us to death. My aunt would make homemade waffles in the morning with strawberries and sugar sprinkled on top and to top it off with a brownie. <laughs> she was that aunt. <laughs> but one day, before, this was before I was a Christian, before I was coming to church, my mom gets a phone call and my uncle had a stroke. And he was hospitalized. He was in a coma for quite some time. And we were unsure of what was going to happen. We didn't really know what was going on. And, and one day we went to visit him and my aunt in, in the hospital. And we, we'd been there for about an hour. We were getting ready to leave. And someone from their church came. They were, they were God-believing Christians. They loved the Lord with all their heart. And they wanted to pray with my aunt and us because we were family. And I was thinking in my head, I was just about to leave. I was just ready to go. It's late. I'm trying to go home. Hospitals make me uncomfortable. And so we, we circle up, we grab hands, we bow our heads and close our eyes, and we start praying. And they're praying for miracles to happen. They're praying for uh, healing to occur. And, and in my head, I'm thinking, this is, this is insane. <laughs> the doctors are unsure of what's going to happen. They don't know if, if he's conscious. They don't know if he, he knows that he's in a coma, if, he, if he'll come out conscious. And then the prayer started to shift. And it caught my non-Christian attention. They, they started praying for God's will to be done, for God to use them and the doctors in whatever way he needed to so that his plan and his purpose would be fulfilled. And I thought about that for the rest of the night. I thought, why would someone pray for something they didn't necessarily want to happen? I thought God was like this Santa where we asked for what we wanted and then we told him when we wanted it. But I just couldn't shake that. I couldn't shake that. They wanted God to just do whatever his purpose was. My last point, or my third point, live life candidly. Live life candidly. Be honest. Be an honest Christian who's, who knows their mistakes, who, who knows their faults. You see, faith is often confused with having all of the right answers. See, God does not want us to be knowers of all things, but he wants us to pursue the one who knows all things. He doesn't want us to be perfect, but to pursue the one who was first perfect. See, a few weeks later, my mom got a phone call, and my uncle came out of his coma, but he, he couldn't walk. He couldn't talk, but he was on the step towards healing, and that amazed me. Each and every day, my uncle, to this very day, has an, has an obstacle to overcome. He can now use a cane. He still can't talk, but he can understand what you're saying, and it just, it astounds me that people so committed to God just keep pursuing God, despite all of their struggles, despite all of their failures, see, Peter looked at the crippled man straight in the eye. And the Bible says that the man turns towards Peter, gives him his full attention, arms raised out, expecting to receive something. And Peter looks at the man and says, I can't give you money. I don't have that. I'm not wealthy. I can't give you money. But what I do have is far greater than that. See, God wants us to recognize that we ourselves are not perfect, but it's our imperfections that allow God perfection to show. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, this is like my life verse. I have a daily reminder on my phone to pray this over my life. It says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. He wants to use you to tell someone that God is the strength 
in our weakness. He qualifies the unqualified. He's a provider of our needs. This man expected to receive money, something to fulfill his daily quota for his begging, but what he got was far greater. See, Peter stepped out in faith and asked God to heal this man. The same thing can happen to us when we step out in faith for God, for our unsaved family or our friends. You better believe that when we pray to God, and our prayers align up to his will, that he not only meets our expectations, but he surpasses them. Last week, um, on Friday, uh, the youth ministry held its annual invite night. And it's a night where we encourage all the students to invite their friends to church. And Pastor Jacob and I were talking, and we were like, we hope that we can get 400 students into this building. And the closer we got, the more skeptical we got. Like, oh, I don't know if this is going to happen. It doesn't seem like the hype is there just yet. You know, maybe we should lower the number. Maybe we should pull the event, uh, the event completely. Friday night came, and not only did 400 students come, but 1,000 students were in this auditorium, this very seats that you're sitting in. <laughs> See, we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to say, God, this isn't me working, Lord. This is you doing something greater. I'm not perfect, God, but you can come in here and do something fantastic. 1,000 students heard the gospel, over 50 salvations. See, the great part about God's kingdom and God's purpose and healing for other people is that he wants us to be involved, that we are tasked with making sure his house grows bigger and bigger. See, people do not want to follow someone who puts on a false persona. They want to follow a God that's real. They want to know that God is actually moving in your heart and your life. Don't downplay your testimony. It's your struggles that have the power in other people's lives. My last point, live life committed. Live life committed. It can get really hard to keep pushing forward in life when life just wants to push right back and knock us down. When it seems like no progress is being made, why continue at all? So you know, I knew about Vineyard for over two years before I stepped foot in here. I had family members, friends, some of you in here maybe were praying for the unsaved to come in and not even knowing it was about me. And then my friends kept inviting me every single week, week after week, encouraging me, building relationships with me. I heard the same thing. And finally, after two years, I decided to step foot into this building and my life will never be the same because of that. See, I love the ending of the story because Peter doesn't just pray for the crippled man and then walk away to go back to his prayer meeting and say, have a good day, have a great life. But he actually extends his hand out and, and, and helps the guy stand up. Can you imagine the faith Peter needed to, to ask a crippled man since birth to stand up? But when he grabbed his hands and he, he asked him to stand, immediately the bones and the muscles and the tendons and the ligaments in his body started to get strength. He stood up. This guy begins to walk and Peter and John take him into the temple. The same temple this man was not allowed to go in just a couple of moments before. He goes in dancing and praising God. And, and the Bible says that every single person in there were amazed because they knew who he was. They knew his struggle. They knew his issues. And God used that circumstance to not only change the man's lives, but to work in every single person around him. So your impact is not limited by one person. Church, do not give up on the people around you because God quite hasn't moved yet. Do not give up on people because everyone matters to God. All lives are valuable to him. He wants to see his kingdom grow and extend to all people. Stay committed to your purpose. Protect your purpose and never let temporary emotions dictate your eternal impact. Never let something temporary or circumstance that's merely a roadblock dictate your eternal future. The best and easiest way to reach out, to take a risk, to step out in faith, is to invite someone to church. So convenient that Christmas is coming up. One of the two biggest years for, for people to go to church. Everyone's just going to go online and Google something. But how much more would it mean if a friend said, hey, I have this great church. We have three different opportunities for Christmas Eve. Come out. Come experience it. It's awesome. I'll be there with you. Let me know which one you want to go to. How much more meaningful is that when we reach out to people and we bring them with us? Not just empty promises, but real truth of the gospel. See, some of you here today are thinking, you know, that sounds great, Pastor Parker. God wants to use me, has a purpose for me. That sounds awesome. But it's hard for me to relate to Peter and John. I don't quite have that faith yet. I'm not there. I'm, 
I'm more of the crippled man. I'm not sure about this relationship with Jesus. I'm not sure about where my purpose is going. I want to speak to you directly for a moment. See, Peter, before he did all of this, didn't have the, the best track record in the world. You know, when Jesus was, was still physically on the earth, he actually told Peter, he said, hey, you're going to actually deny me three times. And Peter said, I would never do that. Why would I do that to you, Jesus? But who else can relate when we say we're not going to do something, but somehow we still find ourselves in that circumstance? So after that happened, after Peter's mistakes, after Peter actually denied Jesus three times, we find ourselves in Acts chapter 3, where God is still using Peter. You guys are not limited by your past decisions. You're not limited by your mistakes. You do not have to reach perfection before you can be used by God. But God takes the imperfect and makes it perfect. I encourage you this morning to pursue the purpose that God has for you. You can do that in any level of faith, any, any level of knowledge, any level of a relationship with Jesus, whether it's your first time or whether it's been 50 years since you were saved. It can all get off track sometimes. I want you to know that you are empowered by God, that his purpose is available for all people right now. And I want to pray for that, so let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for every single per person in this room, Lord. I thank you that you have something specific, God, that you have something meaningful, Lord, an individual to every single person in this room. You know, I feel like I'm going to pray twice. I feel like the Lord is, wants to speak to people who've been in the game for a while, and they feel purposeless. They feel that they've gotten to a point where their purpose is just not visible. It's, it's unclear. So if that's you, I, I just want you to pray this prayer with me in your heart. I want you to say, Jesus, would you make my purpose clear? Would you show me what you need from me, Lord? I trust in you today, Jesus. I trust that you have a plan for me, that you have a purpose for me, that you have something higher and greater for me, Lord. Would you make that clear for my life? In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if that was you who who related a little bit more to the crippled man, like you weren't sure that a relationship with God was possible for you. It is. And I want you to pray a specific prayer with me. So if that's you, would you just say, Jesus, today I trust you. Today I follow you. Forgive me of my mistakes. Make me new. Today I'm a Christ follower. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at And we'll see you next week.